We have been on this journey for about a month, a message series called Swipe Right. Swipe Right. Turn to someone near you and say, Swipe Right. This whole series is about having honest conversations about dating, marriage, divorce, relationships. And today is probably the stickiest topic of all in our Swipe Right series. And then next Sunday, we will wrap up Swipe Right with a live Q&A. So next Sunday, you can bring your friends, your coworkers, text in anonymous questions, and we'll answer them live here. But today, we want to take time to slow down, to tap the brakes, and tackle a topic we've never addressed from the stage here at Life Church. And we want to do it with a lot of love and truth and compassion for everyone. So yesterday, I went to the big monster truck rally at the Dow Event Center. You guys heard of the monster trucks? Bigfoot. Oh, you know, they, they come rolling out and they, they crush cars and they do these weird flips and you inhale all the exhaust fumes, you know, and you go deaf from the roar. And what I found most interesting at my first monster truck rally were all the people who were into monster trucks. For some of them, it was a sport. There was a guy behind me who pulled out a card and he was writing down notes and critiquing how each monster truck was doing, assigning them point values. Well, that there, that's a wow factor of four. And it had a speed factor of two. You know, I, I kind of felt like um, I was in a group that I, I had never uh, been part of before. I kind of felt like an outsider amidst the people of Walmart. I, I mean, I just didn't know. They, they were lovely people. In fact, I, I did run into some lifers. So lots of love to you. Um, and it helped me realize how often in my life, I am in my own little bubble, and I don't fully understand or take time to understand the life experiences of people who may be different than me. And that's kind of where we're at today in our Swipe Right series, because today we want to have an honest conversation about same-sex attraction and understanding transgenderism. Now, this is not going to be a message that's going to hammer anybody, so you can just relax. Everyone's okay. We're all friends because I know we all have different opinions. We have different life experiences, and that can be a beautiful thing when we understand that every person matters. And every person here and online belongs here. There's a reason why on the front doors it says no perfect people allowed. Everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And here's what's so, um, so heartbreaking when we approach this topic. Because with all the opinions and we form our little tribes and you know, we want to say, I'm right, I'm right. Did you know that 91% of people outside of the church think that modern day Christians are anti-gay? 91%. So if you consider yourself a church person right now, you're probably viewed by society as judgmental, as quick to judge, slow to listen. And today, I want to invite you to lower your force fields, lower your defenses, lean forward, and open your heart to truth and grace. It says in John 1.14 that Jesus came full of truth and grace. We've been doing a Christian sexuality series at 707, our student ministry for middle schoolers and high schoolers. And we've used a video series uh, to supplement part of what we're teaching the teens. And after one particular video one night, I had a bunch of high schoolers and middle schoolers saying, 
Pastor John, you got to share this on a Sunday. Like, like, you know that God is doing something in people's hearts when teenagers are begging the pastor to share something specifically on Sundays. And so today, we've kind of edited down uh, one of these videos, the one that the teens really, really were affected by and wanted everyone to have a chance to watch. And so that's why we've got our popcorn. You can sit back and relax. I'll come back at the end of the video with some final thoughts as we continue in worship. All right, watch this. So I grew up going to youth group uh, because I grew up in a Christian home. And in youth group, sometimes they would split us up into the boys and the girls. And whenever they split us up, this invariably meant that we were going to talk about sex. So they would split the boys and the girls up. And I remember at this stage of my life, all the girls were like freakishly tall and wore a lot of eyeshadow. So they'd take all the eyeshadow wearing girls and they'd send them off to, to one room. And then they'd take the boys, they'd get us together and they'd be like, look, boys, we know what you're all going through. You want to look at pictures of naked women, but don't do it. And I was like, okay, no looking at pictures of naked women. And I discovered that I was remarkably good at not looking at pictures of naked women. I was so good at it, in fact, that I started to believe that I was like the holiest 12 year old in the world because they kept saying like, this is the thing that everyone is going, going through. You know, every young man is experiencing this. And I was like, I'm not experiencing it. I think it's just because I love Jesus so much. It took me a little while to realize that I did, in fact, have an experience of sexuality. Uh, it just wasn't the one that I had been trained and braced by my Christian community to expect. And all of a sudden, I went from feeling like the holiest 12-year-old in the world to feeling like the worst possible 12-year-old in the world, the one who was so bad that nobody had even bothered to warn me that somebody like me might exist. I remember I would lie on the, on the bottom bunk of the bunk bed that I shared with my brother, John, and I would whisper, uh, not loud enough that he could hear, but just loud enough that the sound could go up and come back to my own ears. And I would whisper, I'm gay, I'm gay. And the sound of it would be enough to terrify me. I sat there in my bed and I told God, God, I don't, I don't want to be straight though, <laughs> because I think naturally you think to come to Jesus is to come to heterosexuality. But I really sense that God was saying, no, come to me. I am the aim of your repentance. I am the goal of your salvation. It's not you coming to some moral standard. It's you coming to a person. I felt like I didn't have a choice but to believe. And that's the Holy Spirit because Second Corinthians 4 talks about how the, the, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers where they cannot see the light that is in the face of Jesus Christ. But uh, God who said, let there be light has shown in our hearts to give us the light, to see the glory of Jesus. And it had to be nothing but the spirit of God to help me see that Jesus was more worthy than everything that I was submitting my life to. And so my repentance was not an escapism or a fear or me uh, submitting myself to the norms of the culture. It was me saying that God actually was the best alternative to everything that I've been living my life for. The, the, it, was, it was futile and silly to think that anything could make me more whole than the God who created me for himself. And so by the power of the spirit, I believed. Um, and in believing, my temptations did not go away. I just had a greater affection competing with those temptations that I submitted my life to and had the power to do so. So when God was forming me in my mother's womb, there was a time I really did struggle with this, uh, where it says that God knit me together in my mother's womb. There was a time I, I literally remember praying like, well, God, did you drop a stitch then? Because there's a part of me that doesn't feel like it was knit together very well. But understand it like God knit John together. And the truest and fullness sense of what it means to be me happens the closer I get to Christ, not the closer I get to my inclinations. Now, most people in our generation are different. We aren't known for being anti-gay. That's true. And that's a good thing because Jesus would have never been considered anti-gay. He had a very high standard of obedience, but he also loved people who fell short of that standard, which is a good thing because all of us fall short of his standards. And that's exactly what Jesus does with Zacchaeus in the Bible. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and a lot of religious people in that day were known as being anti-tax collector. But Jesus doesn't have this posture. He actually enters into a relationship with Zacchaeus and that's why Zacchaeus repented from his sin. 
It's like what Paul says in Romans 2, 4. He says, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Zacchaeus encountered God's kindness in Jesus. He was first accepted by Jesus before he began following Jesus. And the same is true when it comes to the gay community today. If gay people don't experience kindness from the church, then we are not embodying the kindness of Jesus Christ. All my memories of hearing Christians talk about homosexuality before I came out are memories of people doing one of two things. Either they were making jokes or they were talking about how disgusted they were by homosexuality. And I had a strategy prepared for each of those things. If people made jokes, I went ahead and joked right along with them and tried to laugh at least as loudly as they were laughing. And if they called it disgusting, I just said nothing at all, except exactly one time when I remember a dear friend of mine, the topic of homosexuality came up and they said, oh, it's just so disgusting. And I said, do you think, do you think it's helpful or loving to refer to another person that way? And they said, well, I, I wouldn't say that to them if they were here, but you know what I mean. And I said, what if I'm offended on their behalf? Because it was the only thing I could think to say that felt like it maintained a shred of my humanity in that moment. When I graduated from college, I faced what I thought were my only two options. One was to kill myself, the other one was to come out as a lesbian atheist. And I thought that those were my only two options because the message that I was receiving from the church was to be a Christian, you had to be straight. And I experienced from a young age these ongoing attractions to my same gender, my same sex. And I was already a Christian. I, I prayed the prayer at five years old. I loved Jesus. Like, as much as I knew how. And yet the language that I heard when, you know, I'd overhear Christian radio or just Christian culture is there's like this war on marriage and there's this gay agenda and them out there, those are the homosexuals. But us in here in this Christian world, we're straight and there are acceptable sins and there's even acceptable sexual sins and they were all of the heterosexual variety. And so then here I was with these attractions to the same sex, and I was like, I don't fit the mold. My friend Jonathan was very conservative growing up, and he grew up in a family that was very like, had huge disdain towards LGBTQ people. And I think what you see in the media is very, you know, pompous, very proud, very um, flamboyant gays and LGBT members that are over the top, but that isn't the majority of LGBT people and even LGBT people in the church. There, there are people in your pews right now that are sitting there that are struggling with being not straight or experiencing same-sex attraction, and they are people. Um, the LGBT community are not problems to be solved, but people to be loved um, and people to be engaged. And what happened for my friend Jonathan is me opening up about the things like, oh, I'm struggling with same-sex attraction, but I'm not going to pursue it. I'm going to pursue God, and I'm sacrificing this part of my life. And being his friend and going through things, we were driving home one night and he just started crying. And he's like, dude, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I never understood that there could be people that struggle and wrestle with same-sex attraction and don't want those desires or that experience these things and they choose out of it and they choose into a really hard life. And he was just crying and crying. And I was like, Jonathan, it's okay. Like, you don't have to cry for me. He's like, I want to. He's like, I've been, I've had so much anger and so much hate towards gay people and never have I had the compassion to see them as people or to see them as people that also might be Christians and people that I might be friends with one day. And he was lamenting for me in ways that I couldn't even cry or muster up the tears to cry for myself. And it was really a beautiful expression of friendship to see someone empathize with me in such a way or sympathize with me and um, feel for me the things that I didn't know how to feel. It was amazing to see how me being open about the things that I struggled with or wrestled with was able to soften the heart of somebody else and change their paradigm on how they see the LGBTQ community. Some of you might be attracted to the same sex. Others might have friends that are. Either way, we want to bring clarity to what the Bible actually says about being gay and same-sex relationships. 
First, being gay doesn't mean you don't love Jesus, and it certainly doesn't mean Jesus does not love you. Also, being gay or even experiencing same-sex attraction doesn't mean you are having gay sex or believe in gay marriage. Being gay simply means that you're attracted to the same sex and not the opposite sex. I think we should make a clear distinction between being attracted to the same sex versus lusting after or having sex with the same sex. So when we talk about being gay, I think it's important for us to be clear what exactly we mean by that and to distinguish between a couple very different things that the word gay can mean. One of those things is simply the experience of attraction to the same sex. And by attraction here, I just mean broadly over the course of time, you find that you might have an attraction to a specific person. So when I say I'm gay, I don't mean that I am attracted to every man that I see at all times. I mean that generally over the course of my lifetime, the tendency is that if I'm going to be attracted to someone, it is going to be a man, even though I'm not attracted to every man that I see, though I'm sure many of you are very handsome. Congratulations. But it's important for us to distinguish same-sex attraction from particular moments of same-sex temptation where we might see a particular person and say, ah, I am tempted to lust after that person. And we need to distinguish those things from same-sex lust, which is when I don't just notice, but I notice and I dwell in a way that's unhealthy, in a way that makes someone else the object of my desire. And we need to distinguish same-sex lust from physical same-sex sexual behavior. Now, when we're asking which of those things are sin, I would draw the line between temptation and lust. The Bible is pretty clear that temptation itself is not a sin. We know that Jesus experienced temptation. We know that the, the Bible says when we experience temptation, God will give us a way out of temptation so that we don't sin. So to experience temptation is not sin. Certainly to experience a general pattern of attraction over your life is not sin. Once we move into lust, once we move into sexual behavior, that's where we start to talk about sin. So when I call myself gay, what I'm doing is naming the nature of my attraction over the course of time and naming the fact that when I do experience sexual temptation, which doesn't happen all the time, but happens enough, when I do experience sexual temptation, here is the way that I experience sexual temptation. Those are the things that I mean when I use the word gay. I think I had to learn that God wanted my obedience in spite of my affections, you know? Like I think sometimes we feel as if we have to feel obedient to be obedient and that's just not Christianity. Um, if we're waiting for the feeling to come, we'll never do it. Um, and so it took time, it took discipleship, and it took a measure of just submission to the spirit to say, you know what, I just have to trust you and believe you're good even when I don't feel like you're good. I really just have to not obey my passions and, and help or, or, or trust the Holy Spirit to help me in doing that. And so they still have not gone away, but they have, they don't have as much power over me. And I think that's the difference. I think I've been with Jesus since 2008 now. And though the temptations are still present, they're just not as powerful as they were in the beginning. And I just think that takes time. I think that takes sanctification. And there's seasons. There are seasons where there's loneliness and confusion and depression, where sometimes the, the temptations swell and get a little big and then they get small again. And so I, I recognize that it's seasonal and that it might be consistent for the rest of my life, but that's okay <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is stronger than whatever it is that I feel. And I have to trust him more than I trust myself. Okay, so what does the Bible actually say about same-sex relationships? We live in a society that has recently redefined marriage to mean a union between two consenting people, regardless of sex difference. But this isn't how Jesus or the Bible has defined marriage. According to Jesus, marriage isn't simply a union between two humans, but specifically a union between two people of different biological sexes. In Matthew 19, Jesus said, and God created them male and female. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus is validating our original design as male and female counterparts by quoting from Genesis 2, 24. We are designed to come together as one. 
You might say, well, that's about marriage. What about same-sex relationships? The Bible does directly address same-sex relationships a few times, and every time it does, they are always prohibited. For instance, Romans 1, 26 through 27 says, even their women exchange natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So, does this mean that God has an out for gay people? No, not at all. In fact, this same passage also speaks negatively about the opposite sexual relationships that goes against God's will. Check it out. In Romans 1, 29-30, it says they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. They are gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful, and they invent ways of doing evil, and they're disobedient to their parents. God loves all people, but he equally hates all sin. And that's why we all need Jesus. Well, there are a lot of sins listed in Romans 1. Yeah, I know. Romans 1 and other passages are not meant to single out gay people. It's rather showing us that all of us commit sins and we all need forgiveness and only Jesus can give that to us. Throughout, especially a lot of time in college, I, I did keep reapproaching the scripture to figure out what does God actually say about someone like me? Because growing up in the church, the answer was like, it's, marriage is a man and a woman. And so I just kind of passively, passively received that. Um, but there were, definitely was a time in my life where it's like, well, what does scripture actually say? And so I would keep coming back to scripture because that is kind of the divining rod for our faith. And a lot of people, when they will start asking, what does the Bible say about same-sex relationships? They'll go to one or all of five key passages, right? Uh, the ones in Leviticus, then there's uh, Corinthians and Timothy, Romans. So yes, I like I knew those passages. I'd read through them, and uh, you know, from a just a carte blanche perspective, it seems pretty clear what it's saying. But here's what I also realized is that if the Bible never had any of those passages, if you took a, a huge sharpie mark and just scratch them out of the original uh, biblical text, I would still come to the same conclusion because I would start in Genesis one and two, which is feels like a Christian cliche. Like we always go back to Genesis one and two. Well, there's a reason. That's how God originally designed creation to be. And so when I go back to Genesis 1 and 2, I see this world where God has created man and woman. And in their relationship, the, the similarity of them both being human is important, but also the difference of them being male and female is important. And it says in there, like, for this reason, man will leave his family, his mother and father, and be united with his wife. And it kind of sets up the framework for what marriage is in a biblical sense. And then as we go through scripture, we see that uh, reiterated in the New Testament by both Jesus and Paul. And understanding that sexual expression is meant to be within the relationship of marriage and that marriage is defined as between one man and one woman in a covenantal relationship for life. Then therefore, like same sex sex does not fit into those categories. And so like God doesn't really need to put those Leviticus passages in there, those Romans passages saying like, no, this isn't my best for you because he's already explained what his best for us is. Mixed orientation marriage is when um, two people are married and one of them experiences um, same-sex attraction, which is someone who's attracted to the same sex and the other partner experiences opposite sex attraction. So for example, in my marriage to my wife, I experienced same-sex attraction and she um, does not. So she has experiences opposite sex attraction. And our story is not for everyone. So my disclaimer here is that this is not prescriptive, even a little bit. In fact, I would say don't do it unless you really feel like this is for you, because it is difficult and it's challenging. But it's also been one of the absolute most transformative experiences of my life. So if you're gay or struggling with your sexual identity, what does this mean? First off, it means that God loves all of us and he calls all of us, whether you're gay, straight, trans, bi, pansexual, polysexual, or whatever you label yourself with, God calls all of humanity to follow his direction if they confess him as Lord. Yeah, and this doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. If God didn't love you, he let you do whatever you want. If he didn't care about you, he'd say, sure, go on ahead and follow your own desires. Live how you want, be your own king and your own authority. But none of us would really want that. 
we'd end up miserable because we didn't create ourselves. We don't always know what's best for us and those around us. We don't always know how to make decisions for ourselves that would cause us to flourish beyond the here and now. Love empowers us. God's love empowers us not to become straight. His love empowers us to surrender our brokenness to him daily. So if you're single, God calls you to sexual integrity, to abstain from sex as long as you are single. Straight people and gay people are called to this. And God doesn't promise any of us a spouse. There's no chapter and verse that you'll find in the Bible that says, and thou shalt have a spouse and live happily ever after. Rather, God calls us into an intimate relationship with him. He calls us to love him with our hearts, minds, and strength. And you know what? God may not take away your same-sex attraction, but your life can still be filled with intimacy from walking with Him, sharing your story, and enjoying meaningful non-sexual relationships with friends who walk alongside with you. God is lovingly calling us into sexual integrity in both singleness and in marriage. The Christian ethic isn't always easy for everyone, but it's so worth it. I felt like I was masculine because I was assertive. I felt like I was masculine because I did not treat my voice or speak with a whisper. I felt like I was masculine because I had an opinion, but those are not masculine traits, that's human. Uh, you have men who may lean more emotional and cry. They say, why are you acting like a girl? Did Jesus not cry? That God did not create us with emotions? We're saying that he's acting feminine because he's being an image bearer. And so I think it's these kinds of things that has led to the confusion uh, that many of us all feel. And I think we just have to get back to not allowing culture to define how we understand gender and sex, but we just need to read the scriptures and let them speak for themselves about how we understand the body and how we understand the people that live inside of these bodies. I think it would help us out a lot. I definitely struggle with like, just like the standard of like being feminine. And I don't feel like I'm very feminine at all. I was always kind of tomboy. Like my sisters were always like pretty tomboy. And like, we just, yeah, we like played outside in the dirt. And like my sisters put spiders in their mouth, which is like super weird. <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? Like we were all just like outside and playing. And like, I've always liked roughhousing and like, I don't like my idea of fun has never been like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go paint my nails and like, like design this journal. And like, that's just, I don't, I don't get it. I'm not good at it. And like a lot of girls are, and I'm always like, oh my gosh, like that's always the women's time activity too. Like in any Bible study, it's like, like, I don't, I don't even know. Like we're gonna like paint these pots. And like, I'm just not good at that at all. And it stresses me out. <laughs> and then the guys always get to like go play paintball and stuff. And I'm like, dang it. I grew up in a Christian home. Um, my dad was primarily Catholic. My mom was Protestant. And when they got divorced in when I was in second grade, um, I ended up going from Catholic church to Protestant church. And for me, that was really confusing because I was getting different messages about who God was, who Jesus was, what the point of all of this religious stuff was anyway. And in that time too, my relationship with my dad was really, really difficult. Um, like he was verbally and emotionally um, and at times physically abusive. And I projected all of that lack of like love and safety onto God too. And I figured like, God, like if you love me, why are you letting my parents do this? Like, why are you letting my family be this way when like you're supposed to be a God of love? My dad had this really narrow view of what gender and sexuality were supposed to look like. He said that women should like to cook, like to wear dresses, um, have like long hair, earrings, and love to wear makeup. And I like to wear camouflage, play with my brother's GI Joes, and make his friends cry. Um, so it was just, we had these really conflicting messages and we never saw eye to eye on it. And in the tension of like the dysfunction at my home, um, it caused a lot of fights and a lot of um, just a lot of outrage on his part. And I could see that he was really disappointed that I wasn't this girly girl daughter that he wanted. Um, and when we would have moments of tension about it, he would look at me and say, you know, I always wanted a daddy's girl as a daughter. And so in hindsight, I realized that what my heart took that to mean was I was not the daughter he wanted. 
and somehow my femininity was hard to be around and it was bringing people pain. So somehow I was defective as a woman and not good enough and could never measure up to like these standards of femininity. Gender stereotypes do not come from the Bible. The Bible never demands that males must be stereotypically masculine and females be stereotypically feminine. Hmm. Sure, King David takes down Goliath and chops off his head with the sword, which is pretty masculine. Yeah, but did you also know that David wrote poetry, played a harp, and the dude cried a lot? That sounds pretty feminine to me. And some women are stay-at-home moms who raise their children, which is amazing, right. while others win wars and drive tent pegs through men's skulls, Oof. just like Yael in Judges 4. Both the stay-at-home moms and the female boss warriors are both women. And like we saw with David, some men are super masculine and others are not. One man kills a giant, another one might be a poet. Both are men. In fact, even Jesus himself is flipping tables and cleansing the temple in one moment. Then he's seen weeping for Jerusalem and his friend Lazarus in another moment. Our own savior shows you that you can be fully man and be fully sensitive. Because being a man or being a woman is determined by your biological sex, not whether you match up to some stereotype. I came out as transgender when I was 27. Before that, I had identified as gay, but that label never fully fit. In large part, I, I couldn't really say the word lesbian because I didn't feel like a woman. So that was a major piece of, that I was kind of missing, that transgender, when I was able to actually sit in what it meant to be trans, and I could kind of, it was, it was a wide term, it was an umbrella term. So I used the word transgender to describe the disconnection that I feel from my biological sex and how I feel internally. So I was born and raised in a Christian home, uh, went to church, you know, every Sunday. Um, and, but I, I just knew that I was, there was something a little different about me. When I would see a, a magazine or a poster, I would find myself identifying with a male on it, thinking when I get older, I wanna be like that guy. In middle school and especially youth group, I noticed that I really fit with both groups. I fit with boys, but to a certain point, and I fit with girls to a certain point. So with boys, it kind of stopped when talking about girls and attraction and things like that. And then with the girls, it stopped with boys and, and things like that, but also like bathing suit, bathing suit shopping. That wasn't, I wasn't the person you were bringing um, for that experience. And so being a middle schooler, I just, you know, chalked it up to me being a tomboy and, and, and uh, that was about it and just kind of continued on. But with the evangelical purity movement in full effect uh, when I was in middle school. Um, we were talking about femininity, how to be a feminine woman of God and what God wanted from us as women. So what we really didn't unpack was that the world's definition of femininity and what God's definition of femininity might be different. Instead, I just kind of piled on my, the, the world's construct of what femininity was, and I just applied God on top of it instead of separating them out. So I came to the conclusion because of, by the world standard, as I'm sitting there in my basketball shorts with not my knees like properly closed together, that God was displeased with me, that I was dishonoring him because I wasn't this feminine being. So when I turned 18 uh, and went off to college, I left my faith at home and I just decided to kind of figure out life for myself. I came out as, as gay and, and dated women trying to, to find my purpose, to really feel like I, I, you know, I, I knew who I was. And I, and I found that a lot in relationships where I could feel seen and, and desired and, and loved. Before we go any further, let's understand some key terms used to often understand the transgender conversation. That's right. Let's start with sex and gender. For many years, sex and gender were used to describe the same thing, whether someone was a male or a female. And some people still use the terms interchangeably, but many people today use the terms differently. Nowadays, sex refers to one's biology, while gender has to do with one's internal sense of self, which is called gender identity. Gender also describes how people express themselves in society through their hairstyle, dress, mannerism, hobbies, and interests. This is called gender expression. 
And the term transgender is an identity some people use when they experience some kind of incongruence between their biological sex and their gender identity or their gender expression. And some people who identify as transgender have a psychological condition called gender dysphoria, which refers to the distress that comes from this incongruence between their body and their mind. So gender dysphoria is really elusive um, sometimes, like to the point where you doubt that you even have it um, some of the time because it's it's always been there to the point of like even where you look in the mirror and you just are almost shocked to see that you have a chest or you look down and there's nothing there. And that can be really difficult to understand because again, you know the right answer. You were brought up in a world that um, no, I'm a woman and I'm female. That answer comes very naturally, but then to be shocked when you look in the mirror can be jarring and very confusing. Um, again, like I talked about a little bit with uh, with clothing. For me, for me, clothing is is a huge way that I can alleviate that dysphoria. And honestly, it's it's a journey with God of of what I wear, like. I, with feeling sometimes so masculine that I don't recognize myself. And so there is a, a happy medium, I think, for how do I, as a creation of God, express myself, honoring to God and honoring to myself. So what does the Bible say about all of this? First, the Bible says that our bodies are good and our bodies are male and female. God created biological sex. And this is how we bear God's image, not just as humans, but as embodied humans. Yeah, you remember in Genesis 1, it says, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The Bible agrees with science that humans are sexually dimorphic. Sexually what? Dimorphic. It means humans exist in two different biological sexes. We reproduce sexually and male and female are the terms used to describe the two different sexes. The Bible also says that our bodies and our sexual bodies are good, beautiful, and an essential part to who we are. In 1 Corinthians 6, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are no longer your own, but you are bought at a price. So honor God with your bodies. Your bodies are not some insignificant shell that covers the real you. Your bodies, your male and female bodies are a significant part of who you are, even if you don't like your body or don't resonate with your biological sex. Yeah, a lot of people are confused about what it means to be a man or a woman. It's so important to know that your feelings and interests do not determine whether you're a man or a woman. God determines whether you're a male or female. And this is based on our biological sex, not our internal sense of self or whether we act in a particular masculine or feminine way. But some people would go on to say that if a person's body doesn't align with their internal sense of self, then they should surgically align their body to match their gender identity. Yeah, more and more young adults, and even students are doing this. But I've also seen a growing number of people who regret these surgeries later on. I decided that I wanted to um, start looking into having taking hormones. Um, and so I reached out to an endocrinologist and what should have taken me like three months to to have an appointment for it took me six weeks. And I took that as affirmation, like, OK, like this is this is way easier than it should be. And so I ended up starting on hormones and that relief that I felt just from changing my name, gen or pronouns and, and clothing just continued to, to magnify exponentially. My voice dropped and I felt like things in my body changed, like muscle mass uh, shifted, body fat distribution shifted, and I just began to feel more and more comfortable. Like I am finally like starting to look in the mirror and not cringe at who I see. Like I see this person and I can actually say like, wow, I really like who I see. Like this person is, is fun. This person is special. This person is lovable. Um, this person has a community and this person belongs. And I, I started to really enjoy my life as Jamie in a way that I never enjoyed my life as Heather before. And so I, I continued down the road of, I changed my uh, gender mark legally, I changed my name legally. And the last step that I felt like I needed to do to, to be at ease in my body was to pursue top surgery. I had an appointment scheduled to um, just go over the logistics of it and to meet with the surgeon and to see um, what, it, what the recovery process looked like. 
And as I started taking steps to make this decision more concrete, I started to feel like this uncertainty of like this, this is where things become really serious. Like I can live with my voice dropping. I can live with um, like having shorter hair or wearing more masculine clothing and not feel the same sense of nerves about it. But like having top surgery is, is the thing that cannot be undone and the thing that affects my future more than, more than anything else that I've done so far. And I decided that it, the nerves were coming from a place of I'm making a very permanent decision, not from a, is this the right decision for me? I thought I was just scared of the commitment that came along with it. So I ended up having top surgery in February of 2017, 2016. And I remember the first time that I looked down and saw my new chest, I just felt this sinking despair of this is not what I wanted this to look like. This is not, this is not doing what it was supposed to do. Like I was hoping for like soul level satisfaction and this is just surface level. Um, and I think so often for trans guys, the like top surgery is the thing that's going to make all of your other problems go away. And for me, it just made me aware of how much deeper these problems were. And once the dust settled from socially transitioning, so everyone knew me as Jamie, I had done all of the steps and I had finally done all of the big, like big mile markers in transitioning. I realized like I didn't address the problem that was going on in my heart. Heather's story is powerful. Some of these surgeries are irreversible and have a lifetime of negative effects. Most people who surgically transition will never be able to have children on their own. And medical experts are even saying that taking cross-sex hormones can be hazardous to your health. God asked me to go to this women's conference from the ministry that I had been reading, um, like reading info from. And I was like, again, like, oh, that's crazy. Like this is a women's conference. I'm a trans guy. I'm not gonna bunk up with 12 women and have it be really awkward. But he said to reach out to the women's ministry and I emailed them and I said, hey, I'm a trans guy. Um, I would love to come to your women's conference. I feel like God is asking me to go. Like, what do you say? And they responded just so sweetly. They said, like, we would love to have you part of this. Like, as Jamie, um, we will give you your own room at no extra charge. Um, we will do whatever we can do to remove barriers and to reduce the white noise because clearly God is doing something in your heart and we want to make space for that. And I had no excuses not to go to this women's conference, just like I had no excuses to go to church. And I, the most impactful thing at that women's conference was a message called Your New Name. And the premise of it was that we receive names um, based off of our wounds. So mine were like defective femininity, hard to love, pain bringer. And in the response time after the message, the name that I got from God was Daddy's Girl. And that flipped that wound from my dad on its head and I, I just, I think I cried for like three days. Um, like it was exactly what my heart needed to hear. Like all of the clothing, all of the names, all of the pronouns aside, like I was my daddy's girl and he delighted in me simply because I existed. Before I did anything, before I messed up, before I did any uh, anything that was good, he just delighted in me. And I knew in that moment that, okay, I'm supposed to go back to living as Heather but I can't go back to that prescriptive femininity. And I never felt God prioritize my clothing or my um, hair or what anything that I, anything external, all of that was secondary to him. What I felt he was prioritizing was me understanding that the fact that I am a woman is defined by the fact that he calls me his daughter. Like my femininity resides in the fact that I'm my daddy's girl, nothing else. He didn't tell me to change what I was wearing. Like I still, still wore men's clothing for months after that, but it was a posture shift in my heart of, I can begin to hear good things from God about myself as Heather, as this person that I hated, as this person that I tried to never have to interact with again. Like I could hear good things about her and I can begin to love her. Wow. <clears throat> That's a powerful, powerful video. And in bringing things to a close, I want you to know that God loves you, and this church loves you. I'm so thankful to be part of a faith community where we can have these types of conversations and enrich our understanding of one another. 
So next Sunday, we'll wrap up our Swipe Right series together with a live Q&A. You can come with questions about faith, love, relationships, what we talked about today, and you'll be able to text them in anonymously. That'll be a lot of fun one week from today. In just a moment, the band's going to come out for one last song to send us out, and then you'll be able to grab popcorn and turn in your connection cards. And during this final song, some of us may participate uh, through the giving of our tithes and our offerings, either uh, through the basket that's passed or on uh, the website lifechurchgive.com. It says in the scriptures that he who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Now, if today is your first day at Life Church, please leave your wallet in your pocket. We're not after your money. Let me pray for you all. Lord, thank you for this space, a space of grace and truth where we can wrestle with the hard things and have grace-filled conversations about real issues that impact our lives. God, I pray that the conversation would continue in the days and weeks ahead, that we would learn to treasure and to love one another deeply, just as you have loved us in Christ Jesus. God, we offer to you now these lyrics and our tithes and our offerings, praying this in Jesus' name.